I am so happy to be joined today by my friend and colleague, Barry Lynn. Um, Barry and, um, and I met about 20 years ago um, when I first created the Religious Declaration on Sexual Morality, Justice and Healing. And he was one of the first national leaders to endorse that work. Um, and we've had some lovely dinners and conversations and concerts and lunches over the year. And I'm so glad you're here with us, Barry. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'm so honored that Barry, that you and Joanne, um, your wife have been joining us pretty regularly at UUCR. I'm always happy when I see you're here. Um, and um, a lot of people don't know that you're a United Church of Christ minister. So I'm kind of interested, how come you've been coming to UUCR for services? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, it starts with the music because Joanne and I really love what Jesse and Cynthia and your virtual choir are able to do. And of course, your own messages, Deborah, are very powerful. And I do say we love to hear those children's books being read as well, because I think all of us really appreciate the opportunity to, at least for a moment, to have those childlike aspirations and learn the lessons from those books. We've been spiritually shopping around uh, with UCC churches here in Massachusetts, where I am now, and out in California, where our son lives, and uh, with another a UU fellowship in the Washington, D.C. area. One of the things when I normally come, uh, you don't see me on camera. That's because I haven't had my coffee and I haven't shaved. But today, I've managed to do both. And because the camera's on, I even put on a tie. You know, I think <laughs> the first time in the pandemic that you've uh, dressed. So uh, thank you for being here. Um, so Barry, I want to start because it's something that I think we all need to be reminded of in churches, which is what we're not going to talk about today, which is our favorite candidates. So um, can you talk a little bit about the Johnson Amendment? And I'm curious whether you agree with those who think it's time to repeal it. No, I really like the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment was named after Lyndon Baines Johnson. Lyndon Johnson studied this issue of what tax exempt organizations should be able to do. And of course he had a kind of personal motive also. He had been running for reelection in, to his Senate seat when a religious charity grew up in the state of Texas, but which happened only to raise money to defeat Lyndon Johnson. And he thought that was wrong. It's one of those examples where self-interest leads to great policy. And I do like it. It's very simple. The tax code says for those of us who are involved with 501c3s, I won't get too technical with this, it just says if you're in that status, whether you're a religious organization or a secular charity, you cannot in any way endorse or oppose candidates for any public office. And some people do want to repeal it. And unfortunately, neither our current president nor our immediate past president took very seriously the insistence of that part of the tax code. And some people say, well, this will inhibit us talking about issues. It does not. There's no restriction, realistically, in what charities can do. So if you are on the question of abortion, pro-life, pro-choice, you can talk about it all you want. If you are allegedly or actually a nature group, you can either support the Migratory Bird Act or you can say, those birds, they probably flew illegally across the border from South America. You can say all those things and you don't risk anything. I'm talking about the biggest, boldest, most kind of stick in your eye examples of politicking by churches. Just two examples from a recent election. Uh, one was a, a Roman Catholic, uh, the head of a, a diocese, who put in his diocesan newsletter the following comment. He said that one of the candidates who happens to be a Democrat is against human rights and then compared that candidate, Barack Obama, to Herod, of course, the Roman ruler who, among other things, severed the head of John the Baptist. Or another in New Mexico where a pastor, a Protestant pastor out in the 
in his church, put on the wall two pictures. One was of a smiling baby, and underneath it, the word McCain. And another picture, which purported to be the remains of a fetus. Underneath that, Obama. And then the words, you will decide. Now, you know, these are not things that are designed to start a serious conversation in a congregation. These are things that tell you who to vote for or who to vote against. I like it. I think it strengthens democracy when charities do charitable work, when religious groups do religious work. Why do they do it, though? Some of your congregants here may be familiar with a man named Robert Jeffress from Texas. Uh, we, we found Mr. Jeffress to be involved in a number of I illegal partisan activities over the years, and we uh, reported those to the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, this led Mr. Jeffress, he was very upset with me, and he got one of his friends in California to begin what is an ongoing event, uh, imprecatory prayers, prayers for my death and the death of my family. Oh my. Yeah. Um, it's a quid pro quo, though. I think for Jeffress, if you know him, you've seen him on television with our current president giving spiritual advice. And I think that when charities, including churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, decide to endorse a candidate, in the back of their mind, they think this will help us, our belief, our system, maybe me personally, in the weeks and months and years to come. That to me is not the kind of motivation any charity, religious or secular, ought to have. So let me, let's, let's move on. So, so now it's really clear, we here are not gonna endorse a particular candidate. Yep. We're gonna talk about issues, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you think the most likely scenarios are about um, nine days from now. Um, I was on a call this past week with other UU ministers, and some of the people are forecasting a pretty apocalyptic scenario, including what will happen if the president is defeated and he won't leave on January 21st. Others of my colleagues are really worried that we should be preparing for um, massive demonstrations and civil unrest uh, from the election. And I have to say, I watched... Uh, the trial of the Chicago Seven last night, which I highly recommend to all of you. It's an amazing uh, new movie. Um, and watching what Chicago looked like, I felt fearful about what DC might look like um, in a week and a half from now. So what, what's your best thinking? I think I'm planning to spend the next nine days not worrying about the scenarios of doom, but trying to figure out what we can do religious people and our secular friends to make sure that things happen, the kinds of things we want to happen. And I want to go back to something. In 2016, I, I was very honored to be asked to do the uh, invocation at the annual dinner of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. And at the time, I wanted to make two points in my two minutes. I stuck to my two minutes. One, there was at that time a candidate who said he wanted to make America great again. And another candidate who said, she said, no, we're great now. And I wanted to correct both of them because I don't think America's ever really been great. It's not been great for everyone. It's been great for some of us, but it's never been great for all people of color. It's never been great for all women. It's never been great for all workers or immigrants. And I wanted to highlight that because we should do better than that. I also wanted to make the point that uh, whether we're religious or not, we need to look at what principles and passions are being brought to the table, even by people who would characterize themselves as non-religious, because they can have as powerful a message and as serious a set of principles as those of us in the spiritual realm. And as I looked out over that audience, a huge audience that night at this dinner, um, I saw people who were from every walk of life, every color, every creed, every trait. And I also 
notice something else. So many of these people had been involved in the great social changes of our time, whether they were religious people or otherwise. And I thought, this is what we need to do. We need to lead politicians. Politicians don't need to lead us. We need to do what needs to be done to make sure that our visions of justice, our visions of decency, our visions of democracy are able to prevail. You know, I, it's not that uh, Lyndon Johnson did not just wake up one day and say, you know, we ought to have a Civil Rights Act in 1964. People had to push him to do that. We didn't have a, a Voting Rights Act because people just thought we really ought to implement the promises of those amendments to the Constitution after the Civil War. People had to work on it. They had to push for it. And sometimes there are leaders. I still talk every couple of months to a man named Bill Baird, and I suspect many of your congregants know who he is. He's 88 years old now. But he was arrested at Boston University back in the, I guess in the middle 60s, he was arrested for giving a speech at Boston University and distributing afterwards some over-the-counter contraceptive foam and some condoms. It was illegal at that time, illegal at that time to use birth control if you were not married, not married. So he fought it. There were a lot of opposition to it from within some in the, the pro-choice community saying, don't go to the courts. They're not gonna be with us. Similarly, my friend Evan Wolfson, who ran the Freedom to Marry Coalition, a lot of people even in the LBDQ community said, don't go to the court over marriage. It's too controversial. We should do other things more incrementally. And Evan said, no, we're going all the way to what we want. And of course he won. And it's okay for progressives to have little internal battles, but we can never overlook the conscience of the people who say, I have a plan, please come with me and do the right thing. And that's what we need to do in these next nine days. We need well, to be together. I, yeah, and I think you would agree with me uh, that it's not only the next nine days, that no matter who wins, we have work to do and we'll continue <laughs> to have work to do. But you brought up and um, the Supreme Court. So yes. we all know that Big sigh. Tomorrow, we are very likely, unless, I mean, I can't even imagine a scenario that we're going to have a new, very conservative Supreme Court justice. Um, and we won't talk about how perhaps that didn't have to have happened, but nevertheless, here we are. In fact, we lost a vote over the weekend. So any forecasts, and can you make any of us feel better about what a new court with Judge um, Amy Barrett is going to do on religious freedom cases, particularly, um, you know, in the nearest ones that are most near to my heart, LGBTQ rights and, um, and the and Roe. Yeah, I, um, I don't think I can give you any comforting words about what's going to happen tomorrow, unless there's a, a Godzilla invasion of the United States in the next few hours. It looks like she is going to be confirmed. And I frankly don't think the opposition party really did nearly enough to stop it. So it's going to happen. What does this mean? My problem with Amy Barrett is not just her scholarship, although I do question that. I used to do, back in uh, 1987, I was doing a daily radio program out of a radio station up in Silver Spring, Maryland. And this was the time when Robert Bork was being considered. And I would, we would get these callers or we'd have guests on who were very liberal, very progressive people. And they'd say, of course, we don't want to have Robert Bork on the court, but he's so brilliant. And then I, I started to wonder, how can you be described as brilliant as Judge Barrett has if you reach 95% or more of the time, the wrong legal conclusion. There are other words for that, but I don't think brilliance among them. She says she's an originalist. Uh, that of course is a, a, a kind of uh, the belief that you can reach back and figure out what the framers of the constitution and the states that ratified the constitution, what they really meant. 
And I actually did a sermon, which I'm sure it living somewhere on YouTube at the Community Church of Boston some months ago, saying the two worst ways to make policy in this country, Bible literalism and constitutional originalism. If people want to dig into that, I'm sure it's still on YouTube. These are the kinds of things, though, that bother me more than her scholarship. I would call them questions of character. I don't know why a person, knowing that she is likely to end up on the court anyway, why didn't she say to our president and to Mitch McConnell in the Senate, you know, honest, I love being nominated. I really want to be on the Supreme Court. But can't you just hold off? Do the other work of the people just hold off until the election. And I'm also disturbed, frankly, that she and her husband, who we now know did have COVID, but brought their six, six of their seven children, not only to that big maskless an announcement of her nomination, but also brought those same children into the, shall we say, mask rare atmosphere of the Judiciary Committee hearing room. And I do think that that creates for me a question. And the final thing that bothers me about her is I like people who kind of keep up with the news. When she was asked repeatedly, what would you do, uh, you know, uh, to the Affordable Care Act? And, and what would you do about Roe versus Wade? And what would you do about... She didn't seem to know that our president had made specific promises to the, his supporters that anyone, anyone he put on the United States Supreme Court would overturn Roe versus Wade, would repeal the Affordable Care Act, and most importantly for the near future, would be involved in any legal challenges to the outcome of the election. And Judge Barrett, I, I, she did not, she had never heard of that. She, I, got, I don't know why she thought she was being position for possible appointment to the United States Supreme Court. And then on the non-specific issues where, you know, judges that are coming up, people being nominated for the Supreme Court, are not supposed to comment on pending litigation. I understand that. But when she's asked, well, do you believe that there's systematic racism in the country? She didn't have an opinion on that. She was asked about climate change. She didn't have an opinion on that. She was asked about whether basic principles of the law should be held. I don't speak Latin, but I did go to law school, so I know stare decisis, let the thing stand, let certain decisions stand. She wouldn't even say that the decision prior to my friend Bill Baird's success, Griswold versus Connecticut, which established the right in Connecticut and therefore around the country, that married couples could obtain birth control. She wasn't even sure that couldn't be reviewed again. This, these, I think, well, I'd call them character flaws. I'd like somebody who reads the newspaper, has a respect for precedent, and is willing to say it, and actually has thought about the great moral questions of our day. So let's just take that for a second, which is no matter uh, what happens uh, in nine days, we are likely to have six, three conservative majorities yeah. on the court. And um, unless, you know, somebody gets uh, uh, inspired to think different. Um, so, you know, we're looking at the end of the FCA, we're looking at possibly the end of legalized abortion, or at least across the country. We're looking at possibly at the end of uh, marriage for LGBTQ people and other rights being affirmed. I mean, that for, for us as progressives, not speaking electorally, but as progressives who care about those issues, sure. have some of us, like me and you, have spent our lives working sure. on those issues. Um, uh, what can we do about that? What, what do you think can happen to counter it? I mean, I do think it's time to take a hard look at democracy. And is it best served by the system we have right now? And I don't mean a revolution. I mean just things like uh, apparently one of our candidates is looking into a commission to expand the court. I hate that phrase court packing, although it's kind of happened. Uh, you know, there's something like 200 new federal judges in this current administration, and most of them were kind of rushed through. But I think we need to look seriously at that. And I think I've already on that issue decided, I mean, I actually own 
website URLs for something called expandthecourt.com and expandthecourt.org. And uh, I've, I've been looking for a good organization to uh, that would use those for good purposes. And in case any of your congregants know of any, okay. please let me know. But um, but I do think, I mean, democracy is at risk. And even uh, in a, an interview just released yesterday, a time or Newsweek was interviewing uh, Jim Clyburn, a congressman, African-American congressman from South Carolina. And he said, you know what, of course, He's, an, he's allowed to endorse anybody he wants. But he said, if we make the wrong decisions, democracy may be gone. And although I really love Jim Clyburn, I don't, think, I don't think we can take that position. I think we need to make a decision and a commitment right now, right today, as we made after the last inauguration, when millions of people in every state decided to march in opposition to policies, women's rights, immigration failures, that I'd like us to do the same thing now, commit to doing something on that weekend after the inauguration, no matter who's inaugurated, to do something. And maybe it's as simple as this, since we're not gonna have huge gatherings, what we need to do, just write an email or gasp an actual letter to your elected officials, whether you voted for them or not, and explain your principled positions on the issues that mean the most to you. If it's LBT2 rights, do that. If it's women's rights, if it's voting rights, make a commitment now to tell people what you think. And astonishingly few Americans actually communicate with their elected official on any topic. The last poll I saw, it was 15%. 15%. We, we can, and we've got to do that. Thank you. And um, I can honest, I can guess that in this congregation, we are closer to 75%. So oh, I'm really proud of we have over 88 people working on getting out the vote right now. And, um, uh, but it's, it's really good to talk to you. And we've, we've just talked for about 10 minutes longer than I said we would. Oh my goodness. So um, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope they've all had a good time listening um, to us because I've had a great time. Yeah. Talking to you so thank you, thank you, thank you for yeah. being with us today and for coming as a visitor to UCR. Um, I appreciate the invitation and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be back. Yeah, and you and I will keep talking, I hope, for another 20 years. I'd um, love that. All right. We'll see Barry for the benediction in a minute.